please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions, your weekly dose of what's brewing in the commodity space and what a week this has been for commodities as an asset class. With geopolitical risks lingering, the crude oil prices have seen an upswing in this week with Brent up by nearly 8% and well above the $70 per barrel, forcing a debate on whether $70 is a new norm for the crude prices. This is also a week where the crude prices are headed for the biggest weekly gain since the month of July. But moving on to the metal space, and it was all about aluminum in this week after the U.S. imposed sanctions on Russia's UC Rusal. Rusal is the second largest producer of aluminum, and that has led to a deficit of a whopping 8 lakh tons of aluminum in the global markets. This has helped the aluminum prices to hit a six-year highs today. Alumi aluminum prices have seen the biggest weekly gain in over 38 years and we have the prices nearly 15% up in this week. Moving on to the precious metals and it has been a good week for them as well with the gold prices headed for a second week of gain as concerns in Syria have added to a safe haven buying here. Palladium prices are headed for a biggest weekly gain as well since the month of October. And joining us to discuss all of those commodities now is Christopher Main, who is VP of Oil and Gas Analyst at City. Also joining us is David Lennox from Fat Profits. Gentlemen, hi, thank you so much for joining us. David, let's start with you. And uh, I would want to talk about the crude oil prices first. We are holding above 8 to 9% for both the crude varieties. It is a strong weekly gain. $70 has held every single day in this week. What is your sense on where are we headed now for that? Well, look, there's no doubt that uh, one of the, the reasons we've seen such a strong oil price over the last few trading days is the fact that the Saudis did announce that they did intercept a Houthi missile over Riyadh. So that unfortunately brought the markets uh, into some concern when they looked at uh, where that missile was supposedly intercepted. And it could mean that uh, Saudi's oil fields could come into range should the uh, Houthis have uh, considerably more of these particular types of missiles. So we've seen that reaction quite quickly come into the price. And that was on top of the fact that we did see out over the Thursday trading evening a very, I guess, poor figure coming out of the EIA in terms of the inventory numbers in the US and, of course, domestic production inside the US, which did rise by about 20,000 barrels over the week. So given that poor news, the, the oil price has reacted quite savagely to the, the Riyadh uh, and Saudi news on the international uh, the interception of a, a missile. So while in the back of all of those fundamentals then, David, are, are we holding 70? Are you looking at 80 and beyond kind of levels now coming in for the crude oil prices? Or would you say much of the international uncertainty by now has been factored in? Look, certainly think, we think that if it is a geopolitical, that we have seen the Houthis firing missiles into, into Saudi Arabia sort of spasmodically. So we would need to see an escalation of, uh, of that event happening, i.e. we would need to see perhaps uh, further missiles being fired, unfortunately. And that would, we think, confirm the, the Brent price well above $70 in the near term. If, in fact, it is just a spasmodic firing, as we've seen before, then we think that geopolitical tension will ease. Markets will become less concerned that the Saudi oil fields will be able to be hit. And that means that uh, we will see that uh, premium come out of the oil price. At this point, we would suggest that uh, perhaps uh, the oil fields will remain safe and we will see the oil price drifting back uh, below the, the $70 range for Brent in the not too distant future. However, just going forward, Manish, we do think that we're coming very soon into the northern summer and we do expect to see a very strong demand coming out of the northern hemisphere for, for oil. And, and that, we believe, will be the real sustainable push that we're going to see in the oil prices in the not too distant weeks. Oh, well, absolutely. It doesn't end, does it? Because there's just so much to watch out for. But getting Chris into the conversation as well. And Chris, hi. 
How do you see the week gone by with nearly 8 to 9 percent gains, a new 2014 highs for the crude oil prices? As we step into the new week, would you say that all of these uncertainties, concerns, geopolitical risks would just continue to play on? Has that been factored in or are you looking at further highs in prices from here? Yeah, I think it's a good point. It's been a, it's been a pretty strong week for oil. Um, the issue is that uh, all of these uh, geopolitical, geopolitical disruptions, be they Iran, Latin America, Syria, uh, maybe even Russia, they're not actually affecting any uh, physical oil supplies at the moment. So, yeah, for now, we could see prices stay supported or e even make new highs, as you, as you referenced. But unless there's actually a material disruption to oil supplies, which there hasn't been, then it means further down the line that you could see prices correct lower uh, to where fundamentals probably uh, imply them to be. Mm -hmm. Chris, plenty has been talked about crude oil in this week as well. You have uh, OPEC and the IEA monthly reports as well, where both of these are talking about on how the global inventories have come down quite sharply and how the demand scenario seems strong, especially with the China imports, the second highest on record in the month of March. Uh, how bullish are all of these fundamentals? Uh, they're bullish to a degree. Um, the thing that makes them perhaps less bullish is that OPEC themselves have said that they're targeting inventory levels and getting inventories back to a, uh, a more normal level. So if we're approaching these um, five-year average or seven-year average levels quicker than the market expects, then this perhaps raises the specter that we um, see return of Saudi or other OPEC production perhaps sooner than the market is currently pricing. So for, again, it's the same as geopolitics. For, for now, it's, it remains bullish and remains constructive, but what it could do is it could bring um, some of the more bearish themes in the market to play quicker. Mm. So Chris, what is your sense on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis? Where do you see the crude oil prices now behaving as? Uh, so broadly, uh, I think we'll stay supportive in terms of the crude price through the summer. The summer fundamentals uh, are, are pretty robust and you layer in uh, the geopolitical risk elements that you've talked about. Um, but going into the end of this year and uh, definitely into 2019, uh, we do think that, that you could see a sharp correction lower uh, in outright oil prices, um, specifically in the U.S. as well, where there's a lot of production coming online. Mm -hmm. So any range that you would want to come out with? I mean, are you looking at prices reaching below 60, going up to 50? Because there is a, a divergence when you look at uh, experts talking about the crude oil prices. There are reports which suggest a $50 per barrel in the second half, and then there are about 80 as well. Yeah, I think uh, in in the summer is when you could stay. I don't think you're going to have a correction lower in, in the summer, um, but I think definitely by the end of the year or into 2019, uh, you'll see Brent prices back below $60 again, so in into that 50 range. Um, but yeah, for, for now, this uh, flurry of geopolitical events is really proving to be supportive for the price. Mm -hmm. About the geopolitical events itself, Chris, what is your sense? Because uh, we are, of course, looking at uh, uh, this whole import tariffs, and that has impacted crude. We've seen uh, sanctions from U.S. on Russia, proposed sanctions on Iran, the whole Syria geopolitical concerns. We've seen the gold prices take some support from that, too. So uh, how much of an impact uh, would you see of the global factors on crude, and how have you seen that impacting other commodities as well? Yes, it's a good point. I think on the crude specific uh, element, it's again, it's uh, crude is the, uh, the biggest commodity uh, in terms of trading volumes, and it's probably the one most associated with uh, risks in the Middle East. So even though right now we're not seeing any disruption to the supply side, the, the potential risks arising from Iran, uh, some spillover from Syria, something related to Russia, something related to, to sanctions, mm. where we are actually seeing more meaningful, um, uh, more meaningful uh, price rises or, or, or more fundamentally driven ones is commodities such as aluminium, uh, given uh, the, the, the step up in U.S. Uh, in Ru uh, Russia tensions. Um, so across the metal space, you've seen uh, uh, definitely support there. Um, and I'd say that's perhaps more fundamentally warranted than, than the oil price that's more of a, a knee-jerk shock reaction.
Oh, absolutely. Since you have mentioned about aluminum, how are you looking at that? I mean, suddenly we are staring at a deficit. We also are looking at the prices up by 15%, the best weekly gain in 38 years. How do you look at a commodity that behaves like that? Is it knee-jerk? Will it settle down? Or are you looking at much further gains from here? Aluminum, by the way, is trading at a fresh six-year highs as we speak. I mean, coming to the year, we were supportive on, on aluminium on the kind of, uh, as you say, a deficit market. The fundamentals were good. Uh, and particularly going into the summer, um, we expect the broader macroeconomic picture to improve uh, in China as well. So that would prove supportive. And then we've had the two recent announcements of uh, one, the, yeah, the imposition of uh, tariffs uh, on, on, on China uh, and the potential for a trade war there. And then also the, uh, uh, the move from the US against Russia that's proved very supportive. So again, I think uh, for aluminium, we remain constructive and these, uh, these geopolitical events have just added to the, the constructive backdrop. And, and you've seen it kind of across the commodity landscape where there's been tight supply demand fundamentals and they've been added to by geopolitics. Hmm. David would want to get you back in the conversation. What is your sense on the metal prices really? Because on one side, we have seen the aluminum prices run up and about. And on the other side, it is the zinc prices which are actually closing the week, nearly 5% on the weaker side. So would you say that the whole metal sector has stopped moving as a sector sector and we really are looking at uh, individual fundamentals, each one on its own here? Look, certainly if you have a look at aluminium, it, it's like oil, it's reacting to geopolitical events. Obviously, with the, the US coming out and placing sanctions on Rochelle, they produce 3.9 million tonnes of aluminium, of which 400,000 goes into the US. That means automatically that US customers are going to be looking for about 400,000 tonnes more aluminium. That's something that the market can easily digest. But the concern the investors and traders are, are, are having is around the ripple effect that we may see. Certainly at this point, the sanctions are only applied to Rochelle, but we may see if other countries happen to join in with the US, we may see that other Russian producers of commodities are going to be dragged in as well. We saw a reaction in the nickel price as well as the aluminium price. So really it is very much a watch this space. Aluminium. Certainly with its fundamentals, we wouldn't be seeing the strong rally that we've seen in the price at the moment. Yes, it has had quite a firm run, but it's been that geopolitical that's driving the price just that much further on the upside. In terms of zinc, it's had a very, very good run on the back of a, su a supply-demand deficit, and we think that that certainly remains in place. We wouldn't be shorting zinc at this stage. We think, yes, a pullback will come as, as uh, traders take profits but you wouldn't want to uh, hold those positions for very long. You'd be looking to continue to be long, especially going into the very busy northern summer. Well, absolutely. That's what our experts are telling us, that crude prices, of course, as of now, reacting to geopolitics, but can come under some pressure as we move forward in the day. Uh, gentlemen, stay on with us because we will be talking a lot, a whole host of metal prices after this break. But before we head this break, let's also listen in to the president of Saudi Aramco on the investments in the crude sector and the road ahead for the crude prices as well. Well, there is a... Uh, healthy growth in the market uh, in terms of demand. We have seen, if you look at the IEA or the EIA, in terms of the demand growth for the last three years, you're looking at between 1.5 and 1.6 million barrels. So for three years, the demand growth is around 5 million barrels per day. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of talk about transformation, which is happening in terms of renewables, electric vehicles, and uh, that is taking place definitely, but it is starting from a low base. Even though there is a lot of uh, capital being injected to bring additional shale oil, the decline rate in shale oil is very significant. You're talking about a decline of 70% in the first year. What you need is more conventional oil with a better plateau. You see, the difference is that you need a more sustained plateau, so the decline will not happen. It will take some time before the decline will happen. And that type of investment requires significant capital and also require 
significant time to bring it on stream. Chris is uh, here with us. Chris, I want to really start on with the cu currency space because all the impact that we see in commodities does come in from the currency play as well. And with the U.S. doing what it has been, it has impacted the U.S. dollar vis-a-vis -vis other currencies. How, how have you seen that aspect of the trade? Yes, and if you look back to um, especially 2017 as well, uh, the dollar uh, was, was broadly weakening across both G10 and EM currencies, and it's definitely proved a supportive element for uh, not just oil, but the broader commodity space in general. Uh, this year, uh, commodity and um, FX and more broadly equity markets have, have kind of been wrapped up in a, in, a, in a similar trade. So correlations between commodities and other risk assets such as uh, the S&P or, or, or the dollar have actually been quite high as well. Um, and broadly as a house where we remain uh, I'd say bearish the, the dollar. We still see uh, the potential for further weakness to come uh, against uh, kind of a broad basket of currencies, currencies even. So uh, I think that's going to prove a supportive factor through 2018 at least uh, for the broad commodity space. N not to the magnitude that we've seen uh, up to this point, but it's, uh, it, it kind of is another thing that lends supportive for the whole of the uh, dollar-denominated commodity space. Hmm. Um, Chris, before we took a break, we were talking about the metal space with you as well. Anything in particular that comes to your mind in all of those metals where you see uh, a faster bullish move perhaps returning? Aluminum, of course, has done its 15% up this week. Do you see further gains there? Do you think zinc will come back because that has been the worst performer in this week? Yeah, it's potential. I would say uh, the way we view metals at the moment is that, um, especially from a macro theme as well, when you get into uh, the late stage of uh, economic cycles, uh, metals tend to do uh, tend to perform extremely well, uh, especially relative to energy and also relative to uh, other risk assets like equities as well. And it generally is because at this stage in the economic cycle, uh, the kind of spot demand tends to be pretty strong, uh, and you you kind of seen that come through uh, with uh, physical differentials um, uh, for, for metals prices remaining quite strong so I'd say our, uh, we're broadly supportive uh, uh, or broadly constructive even on the metal space and I think aluminium is, is probably remains our, the area that we're most uh, convicted in. Hmm. Uh, Chris also how do you look at the precious metal space because clearly gold hasn't performed the way it should have the way the uh, global geopolitical concerns or the weakness in US dollar for that matter has been a theme in the previous year and this year as well. What is your sense? Because while the ETF buying in China and U.S. seems to be picking up, it is still not reflecting in the kind of levels that we are in sense of gold. Yeah, um, I'd say that we are. Uh, we remain kind of slightly constructive on gold still. Uh, it's the combination of one, are the, the dollar view as a house, uh, two, uh, that these ge geopolitical flashpoints uh, have proved supportive for gold, at least in, in very short-term pricing. Mm. Um, and yeah, any potential that you could see on uh, a deferral of, uh, of rate hikes could, could prove supportive as well. So I'd say we're no, it's not a, a screamingly bullish, but we're um, kind of neutral to bullish uh, on, on gold through the course of this year. David, what is your sense on the gold prices? Where do you see that headed? Because while we did, uh, while we were able to cross above that 13.50, even did a 13.70 dollars per ounce on gold. Uh, are you are you buying at these levels? Are you looking at a 1400 coming in uh, sooner than what the markets were expecting earlier? Yeah, look, gold has really been quite strange. If you have a look at the geopolitical events that we have seen. Uh, encompassing the globe at the moment, you would have thought that safe haven was going to be the one place that investors would be very keen to be looking for in this sort of environment. We have seen, yes, the gold price react uh, with, with, let's say, a, a fairly subdued rally in terms of the price at the moment, but, but it's certainly not been driven by what we would have thought those safe haven characteristics would have uh, been telling us. We think then that it, the gold price, and as we've said many times before, the gold price continues to be driven by that US dollar. And the strange thing is, when we saw the sanctions coming into play, when we saw the geopolitical play, people started turning back to the US dollar, and we did see a stronger US dollar, and unfortunately that's just kept in check any gold price. From here, we continue to believe that the gold price over the course of 2018 will be certainly 
probably more supportive we expect it to go up, but we are looking for the inflation to hit its, uh, hit its, its uh, straps come late 2018. On the back of the various geopolitical events we've been talking about, i.e. high tariffs, we expect inflation to come into the system, and that should drive the gold prices higher later in this year. All right. Uh, Chris, I want to come to you for a concluding uh, comment before we end this show. How, what would you, if somebody had to take a quarter-wise position in sense of commodities, what are those fundamentals? Where do you see your, you have the best bet coming in in sense of sector when you look at commodities? Uh, kind of 2Q and into 3Q, a uh, broad basket of uh, uh, metals is, 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 a, is a good exposure to have. Uh, and then in addition, uh, in the energy space, uh, outright crude is, uh, there's, there's good seasonal elements to it, but in particular, uh, something that, uh, such as distillate uh, that will benefit, uh, that's benefiting from a similar demand side pull than, than the metal space, uh, and you also get that additional seasonal that we're looking at now. Hmm. And what kind of a percentage gain or uh, movement would you have done in case of crude? Uh, in t it's, I'd say it's difficult to put an outright number on it, but um, especially given the momentum that we have now uh, and the, the, the potential risks we have coming up in May with Iran, with Venezuela, uh, with everything that's unfolding with Syria, then there's definitely uh, a good uh, few dollars uh, more than we can see that, that, than where we're currently trading on the spot that, could, uh, that we could edge up higher. There's still money on the sidelines, I think, that can come into this market. No, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Chris and David, we'll let you go at that. And that's all the time that we have on this edition of Commodity Champions. Thank you for watching.